Continuing from the last time we let off. Now, there was actually an episode that happened in between the previous one and the thing I'm about to discuss with you live on the campaign. Uh, interview with the players, or Interview with the PCs was the name of it. If you feel like going and watching that, you should. It's much shorter than the rest. It's only like 30 minutes long or something like that. And it's literally just the player characters talking about themselves, introducing their characters and whatnot. These are, of course, the three live campaign characters, to make this clear. Snarg, Z who isn't actually Z anymore, and Guido. From now on, I'll be referring to it as Zeriel, because uh, she, her and I uh, agreed that to distinguish the before and the after, Z was the name of the one before, Zeriel is the name of the one after. And in case you're wondering if she really is the same person or not, well, uh, I have gone out of my way not to answer that question. So Geralyn's dead. Da -da -da -da, na -na, na -da -na. The party found themselves, when they escaped, uh, in the... Uh, they, they used Rakarg's special ability to uh, exit through ley lines, which is something that's it's extremely difficult to do, that kind of teleportation. It only works to and from a location strongly connected to the ley lines, and since they were at the uh, one of the facilities that had been connected to the spatial ley line, they found themselves at the spatial temple. Go figure, right? We've, we've, gone, we've gone in a circle, lads. We've gone in a circle. Back at the Spatial Temple, they spent some time recuperating and found out a few qui uh, quick tidbits. First of all, the war has been getting much worse in their absence. Second of all, there was an eruption of the Spatial Ley Line, which is no surprise, considering they did actually kill all of those uh, people, all the Scions who were connected to the Spatial Ley Line, so that's a natural uh, occurrence that you'd think would happen there. And that it's about a month and a week later. Now, this may or may not sound unusual, but from their perspective, it's been like a day and a half, maybe two. And yet, in the, that period of time, the rest of the world has progressed over a month. To this day, the party isn't 100% sure why the variance happened in the time traversal, but it is something that they've had to deal with now. Deciding that now would be a good time to go ahead and recoup and try and re recover, reconnoiter, and otherwise fixate themselves, they decide to go ahead and engage in the spatial trial. Um, again, in the case of Snarg, for the first time in the case of the other two, since Z had never done the spatial trial, and Guido actively refused to before, for pretty cool role-playing reasons, actually. It was his belief that it would be an affront to his aspect of life, life being the polar opposite of spatial. Guido's... I, I don't want to share their trials here. I make it a point uh, not to do so in detail, but I want to cover one thing, because this is plot-relevant. Zeriel's trial involved her ending up in a very unusual place, and things were wrong there. Like, completely wrong. I'm not sure how much of this she's even fully aware, but you know how you go into a trial and, and your mind is altered, so you, you have retroactive memory changing, and you don't know you're in a trial, so you can't behave as if you're in a trial? Well, Zeriel goes in and is fully aware of the fact that she's in a trial and knows that, the, you know, things have happened, nothing's been changed in her memory, and she's in a place where there are these odd creatures, which uh, were relatively short, I'd say about four to five foot tall on average, and they had these very hard uh, exoskeleton things on their back, not quite like shells, but in a similar direction, you know, like, like a chitinous thing, which had very crude and unusual spikes and some... Uh, decoration on them, some tattoos and drawings and some beads, and that kind of a thing. And they stood up on two legs and had uh, long, very sharp, very deadly looking claws and an unusual, uh, almost... Um, I'm trying to think how to describe it. it, it they, they had like a lizard-like... That's not a way to put it. Like a raptor-like face uh, overall, except... Um, uh, far fewer teeth, in fact, no teeth at all. Instead, it was more like a beak that came down, like that, and uh, multicolored eyes. And these all these creatures were all awash in the element of fire, as in, like, anybody with elemental sight or knowledge elements could look at them and see lots of fire. These creatures uh, ran into Zeriel and said, Run! Run! And behind them was something horrifying. Now, uh... Nobody knows what this thing is. It was just this massive beast. Like, like imagine a reed shark, except it, it's like four stories tall, and it's just standing there and, and raging down and, and destroying everything in its path. And Zeriel was terrified of this thing, and it, it tried to destroy her and screamed at her in an unusual language that she could understand. Are you 
Uh, I'm not gonna try, but you know, are you a Viotian? Where are the rest of the oceans? Where are they? Where are they? And every time Zeriel tried to get away, it would just be right back onto her. It was so quick and so powerful that she could not escape. And then she found herself back in the spatial, uh, spatial temple. And as she was falling out of the sphere, she screamed at the top of her lungs, I'm not a Viotian! You may wonder uh, why I include that last tidbit. Let's just say her mentioning that name out in such a public location like that has had some pretty severe consequences. So with that little adventure done, the party uh, reconnoiters, uh, Ricarg, has offered them a favor, basically, which the party spent quite some time deliberating on. Uh, actually, is specifically offered Snarok and Guido a favor because he didn't want to give uh, uh, Zeriel anything. <laughs> and so, it, it, and when I say a favor, I don't mean like, oh, I want a bunch of money. No, no, no. We're talking like a political favor from someone who is as well-connected as Ricarg is. Remember I mentioned that back when uh, he got them to the facility? Uh, Guido asked for him to try and do whatever he could to reunite the Gotrok tribe with the rest of the uh, with the rest of the Lugian people in the Osteth Republic, and he said he'll see what he can do about that. On the other side of things, Snarg asked for assistance in building up uh, a power base. I don't mean like literally. I mean like. A, build, a, a location. He wanted to help build a facility of his own, a place where he could use as a headquarters for this idea that was bouncing around in his head. So Ricarg agreed to both of these and then left. Uh, with Fearness Seal, it is worth noting, Fearness Seal apparently having decided to go with Ricarg because she believes that staying with him and with the rest of the Derekost is, is the proper path for her progression. Um... <laughs> Uh, we'll probably tie up that thread eventually, but it hasn't come back around yet. But suffice to say, Fear Nasil effectively left the campaign at this point in time. This left uh, the three of the party like, okay, now what? And as they were on their way out of the town, uh, a servant came up and said, Oh, you're here at last! Excellent! Let me take you to your ship. The party's reaction was something along the lines of, huh? And they took them, and there was a frigate-sized uh, massive airship just parked over there waiting for them. And it was apparently Zeriel's. I, I know you're probably looking at me like, well, okay, he's been missing over a lot of details, so there's probably... No, there's nothing here. The party had no idea what was going on. And even she'd had no idea what was going on. It was just an airship that was theirs, apparently. Hers, more specifically. With an entire crew uh, whose names I forgot. I, I, I actually have the names of every single crew member. And a bit of personality and backstory on all of them. Because because I'm a weird geek like that, and Guido and I both liked the idea of actually having, you know, a crew for the ship that they, and we had, so we have notes and all the fun stuff. Uh, it's a, it's quite a bit of a multi-racial uh, crew, too. We've got, uh, let's see, there's a drudge, a goblin, a dwarf, at least one, uh, Olthoi, I know there's a Sklavi in there somewhere. It's, it's quite a variety. Men, women, the whole thing. Uh, all of these people you know, are like, yes, we will serve you. And the funny thing is the party spent a little bit of time going, huh? And then we're like, yeah, we'll just go with it. You know, whatever. We, we, we've we done some weird things the past. We'll just go with it. And just decided to go ahead and take this on face value and not say, it's a trap. So they have an airship now out of absolutely nowhere. It is an exceptionally advanced airship, but still rather... Uh, Low key. In other words, it has a lot of room for upgrades, improvements, and customization. In fact, the inside of the airship is, I'd say, maybe only a fifth of the way done. The rest of it is, uh, and I forget the real life term for these, but it's like uh, sections of bulkhead and decks that are deliberately made to be modular and empty. So you could turn them into whatever. You could, you could like, knock out, or they're not even walls. There's no walls there. So you can just connect walls in order to make this area, you know, this particular section and have the wiring go through and all that stuff. It, it's, it's basically designed so they could customize it however they want. Um, so they're like, okay, cool. We'll take the airship and I guess we'll go to Aljolima because, you know, we, we haven't been there in a while. So they head to Aljolima. They learn that the war effort is going badly, and they decide... Uh, oh, I'm sorry, they, they do a bunch of other things. I'm going to skip a little of the details. They did a lot of cool stuff, role-playing stuff, uh, catching up stuff. One of the biggest things for the party is the essence of, now what? You know, we, we defeated Garolin, now what? And the, the party as a whole is, is still kind of trying to find their footing on exactly what they want to do in the post-Garolin society here. So... 
unfortunately, they, they basically had a plot hook dumped in their lap. You see, you remember Nawbone all the way back at the beginning of the campaign and Snarg's uh, leader, basically, at least he was his leader. Uh, Nawbone had personally led a small group of people south towards one of the forts, which was a Navere fort and had been taken by the Alluvian forces. In the process of that interaction, uh, Nawbone had actually been captured, along with a few other people, but Nawbone's the, the pertinent one. Nawbone decided to accept being a political prisoner in exchange for his troops being let go, which was actually probably a bad move tactically, or at least strategically speaking, because Nawbone is extremely valuable of a prisoner. And so Olivia was making demands of what exactly that uh, Al Jalima was willing to give up in order to get Nawbone back. By the way, uh, this is also when they find out that over the last month and a half, Nawbone has basically become the commander, uh, supreme commander of the Al Jalima forces. They also find out that Slavina of Dragonflare, the kobold woman, the matriarch, uh, who's a longtime friend of Zeriel's and Z's, um, she has become basically the chief advisor of the governor of Al Jalima. And she is currently thinking that their best hope for continued existence is total surrender, because the Alluvian forces have been bearing down pretty hard. Now, they try to get a little more information. The, the war has been going badly for them. Uh, the, the Confederacy isn't a Confederacy anymore. They, they kind of, there's still uh, some, like not everyone is fully aware of this basically, but the state of Al-Jalima is no longer a part of the Union. Neither is the state of Tufa or the state of Zykal. It is, uh, the state of Yarak is trying to keep the Union together, and it is believed is actually strong-arming strong the state of al Arkas into staying in the Union. But that's it. It's like al Arkas and Yarak, and the other three states are on their own. Now, that being said, the state of Al-Jalima, Zykal, and Tufa have been trying to form an alliance together to form a unified front against the Alluvians. You might wonder, well, why, why this thing with Yarak? To summarize excessively... Iraq has been acting very strangely and has not been taking care of its member states and has been focusing like on sacrificing the other states for the sake of Iraq. And the other states didn't like that so much for, for some strange reason. So there it is. Uh, Al Jalima is also reaching out to Collier in order to try and get them on their side. Collier was very much on the fence on that. So they, did, the party, having reached all this information, is like, we got to go save Nabon. So they, they take the ship, they go down, they do this whole operation. They go through an occupied town. They find out how exactly Luvia is dealing with the conquered cities. Okay, this is great. They have, obviously they have military patrols out and all that fun stuff, but they're going with passive... Uh, cultural assimilation. They uh, have actually invited Alluvian companies into these new cities to set up and are giving those new companies, uh, or excuse me, those companies um, benefits basically. You know, we'll, we'll take care of this, we'll cover this cost, and we'll give you tax write-offs if you come set up here so that these people get a taste for Alluvian goods and Alluvian, uh, you know, lifestyle, and then we will slowly, the, the, the intent is to slowly culturally assimilate all of the Navarre towns into Alluvian society so then they can become part of uh, Alluvia as a whole, which the party finds insidious for some reason. They keep going, because there's nothing they can do for that town other than just kill all the Alluvians there, and that's probably not going to help anyone. And it turns out Nabon is being held in a cliffside facility, which uh, <laughs> they, they come up with a unique plan for. Now, I'm going to rewind a little bit. Um, in, in Like, a period of almost a week has happened. In, in the time I've just, you know, from from them going at showing up at the Spatial Temple to them going up to Al Jalima to them going down here to this fort, it's been several several days. I think it's like five days, something like that. But it's it's quite a while. I mention this because in the past days, again, they've been trying to figure out now what. One of Snarg's biggest big ideas is he's come up with an idea for a new mercenary company, but not quite. He calls it. It's this brand new invention. He calls a PMC, private military company. Now, the difference between the two is funny, because it's actually just a matter of distinctions, but it's an important distinction. Any mercenary organizations have to list uh, casualties and costs whenever they portray the bill, basically. So that, that becomes a part of news. PMCs don't. In other words, from the public's eye, if a PMC moved in, and this is in oh, Dareth, by the way, not in real life, although this kind of applies in real life, um... So if a PMC moved in, and uh, and a PMC is of course completely not part of the order of battle at all, 
and then they leave, having accomplished their objective, the public just sees that the objective has been won, and none of their people have been lost, and it was quick and easy and clean. The mercenary group goes in and accomplishes it in the exact same manner, if this was possible, like if the exact same thing happening, but they were just a mercenary group instead of a PNC group, they'd come back and they learn about all the people who died, and all, the, all of this happened, and then this area was destroyed, you know, all that it, stuff would become public information and part of the record, and everyone would be like, oh my god, you know, that was so horrible. So there's obvious benefits to hiring a PMC, even though it's just a bit of legalese, really. But the other thing Snarg is going for, because do you think he's being horribly evil here, is the idea that a PMC is something who's not just a fighting company. It is not just an organization that's designed to fight, which basically every mercenary corps is. Mercenary corps exist to, to fight, and that's it, uh, defensively or offensively. PMC, at least, in again, in Dareth, in PMC, you could be hired to, to uh, you know undertake operations or take down dangerous you know local beasts or to try and rescue people or you know uh, lots of different things that don't involve killing so snark has been putting this thing together um, and uh, he's, he's been calling he calls the idea uh, blood fox or the blood foxes or the blood I think it's the blood foxes oh god it's actually been several weeks since I've seen my notes on this here I, I want to be sure so I'm gonna turn my monitor on really quick we interrupt this to check our notes. Because I know the name of the town that he'll eventually get is Fox Ridge. But I really want to get this correct. I would really feel stupid if I screwed this up. Hang on. Uh, is this it? Blood Fox. Okay, it is Blood Fox. I am right. He's got a logo and everything. You know, I could just read this really quick, if you don't mind. The Blood Fox is a private military corporate company that specializes in fielding elite teams which venture both locally and abroad, performing information gathering, protection, guarding, and other appropriate duties. They are accepting of missions also suited to, suited to mercenary groups, although they are more stringent regarding those. All members belonging to a single team for the duration of their career are skilled at stealth, survival, tracking, and combat. Many are specialists in other useful skills that differ from team to team. Because of this, certain teams may be more suited to certain types of missions than others. Everyone in the Blood Fox are expected to hold themselves to a high quality of skill and character, both on and off the mission, for their own good, and of course, the reputation of Blood Fox as a whole. This idea, uh, from what I understand, I'm not going to read the whole thing, he's got quite a bit of a document, it's pretty awesome. Um, but the uh, idea as a whole here is, uh, actually I'll read a few more things, is to kind of help replace the Adventurer's Guild, which has become defunct at this point, and try to come up with a new organization that can still function in the modern society without being, you know, an amoral, immoral company of doom. Um, so he, he has a couple of memos here which are written fully in character. For example, Combat, survival, and stealth are not the end-all, be-all. If a member can prove themselves to be a valuable asset without excelling in all three fields, they should still be considered for membership. You must ensure they do not compromise the three basics, however. Memo to a local captain. Uh, not anything we need to say officially, but we need to watch for individuals who have misaligned goals. The entry trials are a moral... Mor mora morals test. We don't want certain characters in the Blood Fox. We are not... The IGA, and we do not want the reputation. It's another memo. <sighs> Addressing new rangers in a speech. You'll learn to trust your team with your life, and they will trust you with theirs. You will learn each other's abilities and tells so well you'll be able to communicate with just a glance. You will hold each other accountable both on and off the mission field. Prove your integrity and the dis discipline of your team, and they will prove it to you. Um... <laughs> this, apparently, uh, they're having a ball game, and and uh, their first official Blood Fox ball game, and and one of the notes there was, "I'm pretty sure you're not allowed to do that, aren't you? No? Eh, well, it's an official rule now. Play. It's just lava. You'll be fine. I bet it didn't even hurt." <laughs> uh, equipment uh, to, as a memo to a local ranger. Although an interesting proposal, I don't think a pair of huge vice grips should be part of standard equipment package. However, you are free to continue using your own personal pair. I was told they were unexpectedly useful during your last mission. And regarding tactics... I have heard that your Geomancer Yellow Magic combo tactics have proven very good in cross-team training. Uh, not very quiet, uh, but they've been described to me as very unique and effective. I'll be returning in a few days and I'd like to see this in action. Keep up the good work. Another note here. This one is to a captain. 
I realize it was the most effective thing to do, but you injured several people who had nothing to do with this mission during your last attempt. The next time, pull back. Go at it from a different angle. No one who doesn't need to be involved should be in the middle of what we do. That is not what we are about. Another one here. Act with caution when dealing with this Confederacy mission. There are people caught in the middle of this war who have no say in what is happening. Make sure they are kept safe during transition and there's minimal amount of conflict. We cannot stop a war from happening, but we can minimize casualties. Offer aid, if possible, and expense, and expense it when you get back. Let me know if you need anything special. Finally, a note here to an outrunner. We want to work with the Order as much as possible. Volunteer for missions with them if you have to, especially humanitarian missions. They are good candidates for young members since the likelihood of dangerous missions is far less. And then there's, he's got a bunch more. I, I, I'm, I'm going to go ahead and skip down the rest because there's a lot more there. Suffice to say, uh, that's been Snarg's focus. He wants to make this Blood Fox PMC thing a reality and he's been pushing for it and he's, that's what he's turned in that uh, solid to Ricard for. He's going to get a, a whole place set up with that. Also, one of the pieces of loot they found, this is very suspicious, uh, this was on Erlenth Le Cell, in one of the chests that was created from the golems, right? One of those uh, contained a ring which actually turned out to be a, uh, a, a an extremely, extremely important family ring of Toltarn of Omani, the gentleman who was the governor of Aljalima. He was so grateful for this, and in addition to this and the other things they've done in service for Aljalima, and on uh, the word of... Um, Slavina of Dragonflare, he decided to go ahead and basically give them land. Uh, a, a, an entire mountain chain, well not a mountain chain, but a single ridge, one one mountain area which he has bequeathed unto them. He didn't just say, here's a mountain, he gave them options. He gave them like five options, I gave the players like five options, and they decided on the mountain. Uh, so that's the place where all the, uh, where Ricarg is going to be helping set up a base. That place has been dubbed Fox Ridge and we'll include uh, more details later when we actually visit there in character. One of the other things that happened, now that I'm thinking about it, is those four chests, excuse me, five chests, uh, emerald, sapphire, ruby, uh, emerald, sapphire, ruby, I'm missing one, something else, and diamond, uh, were worth a ridiculous amount of money, but trying to find buyers for that was pretty difficult. So Zeriel was basically, you know, putting out feelers to try and find buyers for that. Now I'm going to fast forward a bit because she didn't find a buyer for that later, but I want to talk about it now. She did find a buyer for the diamond chest and made a ridiculous amount of, of money off of that. I'm going to tell you this even though this is out of character knowledge. There was, there have been several plot threads involving diamonds across several points of the campaign and several hints of how those tie together. I'm told I'm too subtle in my storytelling sometimes because uh, basically no one picked up on any of this, but uh, except for my sister, who I said it outright to. But um, So I guess that doesn't count either. Either way, they've all kind of been tying together because there's someone out there who's been trying to get a large amount of diamonds for some nefarious purpose that had to do with the light ley line. Well, in case you're not aware, I mean, when they defeated those golems, they reverted to the chests and they were like, ah, they're defeated, they're dead, excellent. Except they're not dead. Every, now, what happened specifically was they analyzed the chest and said, yeah, they're totally dead. And then they asked, they weren't quite sure about that, so they had Ricard look at it. Ricard looked at them and uh, lied and said, yeah, they're dead. They weren't dead. They had, they had turned into chest form to, to spy on the party and perform their other actions they had been assigned to. So this diamond chest, which is a fully functional, still alive diamond golem, <laughs> which is a super weapon in every sense of the word, was given to this villain over here who was trying to do something with the light ley line. And you could probably put the rest of the pieces together. I don't think I need to really fill that one out. So that particular quest has been completed because of, of the way that turned out to be. I know I didn't quite plan it that way, if you're wondering. Moving on. So, uh, Snark has been doing this whole thing, and he has actually recruited quite a few people. And I just realized I skipped over something because I'm stupid. Uh, or did that happen later? No, that happened later. I'm sorry. Ugh, timeline. So they they spent a while in the Aljalima area. Uh, so they go north, they go south, and they had recruited a new individual into into the, into the blood flocks. Uh, the way I've been thinking of it from a gameplay perspective, if I can diverge for a moment, is 
Snarg has been getting squads of totally faceless, totally nameless people. And then each squad gets a named person, who I actually bothered to make a personality and, and character and backstory and class levels for, who actually runs the squad. And each one of these people has a specialization. I actually already have in mind eight different people, uh, it's actually written down, who, who have the specializations. And so, you know, she, he got someone who was a sniper specialist, basically. Someone who was really, good, really good uh, with a, a bow and a crossbow. And so she was the support for this mission and actually ended up being very valuable for it in trying to recover Nabone. Snarg very, very nearly died, got extremely clever, ended up getting Nabone out, and Nabone, who, is, uh, who is, has levels in Frenzied Berserker, if you know what that is, literally crashed his way out of the walls and uh, got them out, and they somehow managed to escape. But something really, really bad started happening as they were escaping. See, I kind of skipped over a detail here. This is very important. There were three alluvian frigates just parked at this particular fort. They were undergoing maintenance. And Z, Zeriel, excuse me, Zeriel looked at those and said, we can't just leave three frigates, three military-grade frigates, just sitting here. You know, that, that has to be dealt with. By the way, for those of you not aware, uh, the, uh, there's only one type of airship above a frigate. And there's only two of those, like, in the world. So, frigates are a pretty big deal is what I'm trying to say. So having three of them right here was just something they couldn't pass up. So Zeriel decided to go forward uh, with one of the, the people with her as a, posing as a servant and posed as a nobleman of Alluvia who was here to inspect the ships and lied her ass off to get herself in and inspect the place. Um, now, she has a really high deception score, but even then, she actually came close to failing several times, to give an idea how difficult this was. What she found when she was in there is the places, the, the, the ships were under lots and lots of work. I mean, they were just being practically overhauled completely. But looking at it, she couldn't tell anything that looked like the damage they'd claimed. It looked like they were doing something else to it. And she never really figured out what, but she did manage to try and sabotage them a little bit before she got out. And as they were leaving, as Nabon was breaking up, the three airships started taking off. Now, an airship can obliterate a person. There, there's, no, there's no contest there. It, it would take something insane, like some kind of uh, incredibly augmented tusker, to be able to take down an airship, right? So, uh, at least from a ground perspective. So they uh, decided to pull an emergency thing and translate it out. Which, uh, fortunately, everyone involved made their will saves, so that wasn't a huge issue. So they got Nabone back. Yay! Mission accomplished. Nobody died, even though I actually 100% expected at least one death on that mission. I was actually predicting two as likely, and one is definite. And nobody died, so <laughs> congrats, party. They make their way back, and they're like, okay. And they were waiting on uh, some real, uh, not real life, but, you know, they, they decided to get the mountain, so they gave the nose, you know, we want Fox Ridge. And it was going to take some time and paperwork, and they were getting set up for a few other things. And so while they were waiting, they decided to go and just do a quick adventure. Literally, they, they heard about this quest hook, and they were like, yeah, okay. Turns out, there were some equipment irregularities in a town just south of Aljolima uh, called Alzavros. And... Alzavros, it was weird because the uh, PTC, the Provincial Trading Company, was in charge of, this, of the town. And in, in fact, if not on paper. And they were, they were just having equipment regularities. It was weird. Stuff would just get stolen, but then it would end up in the right hands, and sometimes it wouldn't. And everyone there just blamed a desolate. It was clearly a desolate that was doing it. And that was the strongest theory, and that was what the local uh, person in charge was thinking. The party came in and said, we'll go ahead and look into this for you. They actually spent a while in Alzavros. I hate to fast forward through this because there's a lot of good role playing and information dumping there and a lot of foreshadowing. They ended up meeting two more people who they would end up recruiting. One is an ogre. I'll talk about ogres in just a moment. Uh, who was really good with math and really good with uh, payroll. He was actually a accountant for a local crime boss. Um, they also encountered a woman who... Or was it a gentleman? I, I forget which. I get these confused. But basically they encountered a geomancer. Who, uh, which is pretty rare. Geomancers are actually uh, fairly rare in this setting, despite the set, despite the elementalism of it. And so they decided to recruit him for uh, for the Blood Fox. Now, after both of these wonderful tasks have been completed, they went ahead and you know researched the situation, and they determined <laughs> this is hilarious. They were pretty sure it was this one guy, a half elf, uh, half elf, half orc, I believe. 
who was who was the one in charge, who was behind all of the thievery. They found no solid evidence, but they were pretty sure it was him. And at one point in time, they discovered he was fleeing town. So they're like, oh, we're not going to allow that, are we? So they go after him, and then some funny things happen. See, they go after him to one of the towns in the southeast. Uh, there, I forget the name of the town, it does not matter. That town was literally on fire. It was being destroyed. It was literally the site of a battle that was actively happening in the war between Alluvia and Navarre. And the, the scene and the stage were set for the party to finally see, for the first time in the history of this campaign, the front lines of the war, and to really interact with that. And uh, Snarg and, and Zeriel are staring at that, and they look at them and they said, Nope! And they turned around and left. <laughs> so they, turned, they, they got the hell out of Dodge. Very heroic. And um, <laughs> my party constantly surprises me. And they found the guy they were tracking, and they tried to disable him. Now, it is possible to cast spells to do subdual damage. Uh, there's a feat for that, a metamagic feat. So Zeriel casts a big old fire spell with tons of damage, but with subdual, so it would just knock him out. Well, it, it doesn't just not knock him out. It knocks him to down and sets him on fire. For those of you not aware, uh, there is a distinct difference between fire and the element of fire in this setting. This is a magical energy source. This is fire. And so she hit him with this and it caused this. That's not what normally happens. That's not how magic in the setting works. You don't, you know, you can't light a, a campfire with the fire spell. It would just destroy the, the wood with fire energy, right? Um, so the fact that he was on fire was wrong and shouldn't be working like that. And after a few more experiments, Zeriel discovered that magic in general was wrong in the region. So then they got the hell out of Dodge even more and got the hell out of there. God, guys. Um, so after having apprehended the, the near charred to a crisp guy who very, very, very nearly died, he was at like negative nine health or something like that, um, they stabilized him barely, got him into town, turned him into the authorities, got their reward got the two uh, recruits I mentioned, completely ignored all the desolate hints, uh, did a lot of other really cool role-playing stuff. It was actually a really good mystery. I feel like the party uh, did a good job of unfolding it. Uh, I don't mind saying that they never fully figured out what happened, <laughs> but uh, we'll see if that ever comes back up. It might not. It was intended to be a small thing. It's just I like mysteries and I like crafting them. Um, so they get back to Aljalima, and the thing's done. Okay, we've got Fox Ridge, we've got this. Excellent. What's our next plan? Well, they decided their next plan was to go down to Osteth. Now, they had a bunch of reasons for going there, but the most important one was Guido hadn't been there in a while, and really wanted to see what was going up with that, and Guido, this whole time, he's taken... Okay, Guido has been taken over the captaincy of the ship. He's the one actually captaining the ship, even though Zeriel is the master of the ship, master and commander. There is a difference, right? So, Guido's been taking that role, and he's been taking to leadership quite a lot. He's been really getting into it, and he's been inspired uh, in his own way by what Snarg's doing with this Bloodfog group, which at this point has two full squads of people, uh, and, and, you know, he's got his own guys working for the two elites, two squads. So he's like, okay, this, this is working out. And Guido really wanted to do his own thing. And he started pushing in the direction of making a trading company. And really trying to use their unique resources to do things that other trading companies can't. To kind of muscle into an already very uh, busy market. And to try and start taking over. And he really liked that idea. So this was one of the other reasons they were going to the Osteth. To try and establish uh, trade connections and whatnot down there. Because the Osteth is a great place to trade with. They get down there, and a bunch of little stuff happens, which I'm going to skip over. But they also find someone who... I'm going to name drop, and, and if you've been following this thing, I don't even remember if I've mentioned it before. But he's been a very important NPC. They find a gentleman named Ogren uh, of Anvilmar, I believe. But I don't remember his clan name off the top of my head, because he changes it periodically. Ogren was one of the members of the Undermarket, who became part of the de facto exchange. He was their accountant, in charge of actually running the books and the money. Uh, all the way back in the day, he gave the party a quest to go and take out Bonebreaker, which the party then found out was, was ludicrous and was literally just designed to test them, because they, they were never intended to take out Bonebreaker. And uh, he, he, he and Bonebreaker, over a month and a half ago, uh, bailed on the exchange uh, for reasons that have never actually been fully explored, other than some concerns with the leadership of the exchange. But they bailed. They got the hell out of Dodge, 
And so they see Ogryn here, and they're like, Ogryn, and Ogryn's freaking terrified. It's like, God, please don't kill me, please don't, God, please don't kill me, please. And they're like, it's okay, it's okay. We're not here. And he actually assumed they had been sent by Zeiss, over on the forum campaign, who is still running the exchange at this point, to go kill him. And because uh, one of the other things Ogryn did when he left was he took, well, Ogryn and Bonebreaker both, they took the money with them. They, they, like, stripped the exchange dry of all its monetary resources, all its on-hand cash, which was quite a decent chunk of, of change. But no, they assured him they had nothing to do with the exchange, and they were just here to talk. And after some interesting diplomacy and role-playing, uh, basically Zeriel and Guido managed to convince him to um, invest in this company Guido's setting up and in, uh, in her own uh, spy network. By the way, <laughs> that's the third one. So Snarg's creating a PMC. Guido's creating a company, Zeriel's creating a spy network. This is what all three of them have decided to do in the post Garland society. And again, I mention this now because this is when this really started to take, uh, take hold. And so she really wants to have information, knowledge, and, and the politics of the situation. She wants to have uh, the imperial intelligence thing, really, if, if I could just put it bluntly. If anybody watched my tour run. And she wants to use that to change the world. She she is the one of the three who actively wants to change the structure of the plant of the world because she thinks it's wrong. Snarg wants to help try and fix things and take care of people. Guido, I have no idea what Guido wants. You'll have to ask him. But that's the intention there. Um, so she goes ahead and gets Ogren to invest in them. Quite a chunk of change. It's worth noting. Lord knows he has it. And. Uh, they find out from him where Bonebreaker is. Now this was a lot of fun. They head uh, west towards this town where Bonebreaker is, and it turns out this town is actually under siege in the Ostath by people. Now I know you probably don't fully understand what that means if you don't know the Lord of the Setting, but suffice it to say, the Ostath Republic is a nation in that, that, that exists in an extremely wealthy, rich, uh, resource-rich, incredible farmland, incredible... I mean, just, it's a bounty, bountiful land that also happens to house some of the most terrifying, dangerous animals on the continent. Uh, the only places that could probably rival this place for sheer deadly factor are the Crater and the Dyers. So the Osteth mountain range, uh, is, is, which, for which the Republic is named, has an entire military and an extremely well-trained, well-armed, well uh, well-funded military, well-motivated military, whose only purpose is to keep the people safe from everyday life, from all the wildlife and all the flora uh, and, fl excuse me, fauna and flora out there that will kill them horribly if they don't. <laughs> but this is significant because anybody out there who, who knows anything about military tactics knows you're, if, you're, if you're trained to fight people, you're trained differently than if you're fighting animals, right? It's, it's a completely different mindset. So the Republic was under attack from people, and they weren't really adapting well to fighting other people, especially since fighting people is kind of against the mandate of the Osteth Republic's military. So it really wasn't working out well. Bonebreaker had volunteered to help out because that's the kind of guy Bonebreaker actually is. He is also a frenzied berserker, by the way. What can I say? I like the class. It's also useful when you need a Hulk-style character. Because Bonebreaker, is, Bonebreaker has a ridiculously high strength. And int, actually. But, so they go there, and they actually fight a large-scale battle, which I showed off on, on the actual uh, session there, where they were fighting against multiple units of enemies with multiple units of their own, rather than just the standard, you know, here's a grid and here's five guys kind of a thing. I liked it. I thought it worked out pretty well. Uh, it did take a while which is understandable. And during the course of this, uh, it, it I'll go ahead and summarize a little bit for you. A couple of really significant things happened. They ended up winning. Um, they discovered a few key facts. These people who were attacking from an, or from an organization called the Reds. Now, I've actually name-dropped them a couple of times before in the actual campaign proper. I don't remember if I have in the summarization, but I'll summarize it here really quick. The Reds are a pirate group. They're arguably the only pirate group, the only actual group of pirates. I remember when I mentioned the Black Rhine earlier, the difference between bandits and pirates. These are pirates. These are enemies of all sentient life. These are horrible bastards who are willing to do whatever. And they're actually pretty well known across the country, and they tend they are very well funded and very, very vicious and brutal. 
And they're the ones behind this attack. And the funny thing is, they're not here to conquer or anything. They're training. They're using these you know, little attacks against the Osteth military to train their forces to be able to conquer other places. They're trying to. They're they're thinking that this war is the perfect time to carve out a little kingdom for themselves. And they're right. This is the perfect time for them to do that. And if not for the party's intervention, they would have absolutely succeeded in that. The other thing that happened is Guido vanished. <laughs> I'll cover that in just a moment. Basically, Guido decided to go ahead and translate. Now, this is the first time Guido's tried to translate since uh, all the way back when he got his, his soul uh, messed with during the augmentation thing, way back in the facility, which at this point is almost two months ago now, right? So, this is the first time he's actually tried to translate since then. He tries to translate, and just go, he, he, he goes away. And it's funny, because the way I did it live was like, okay, Guido translates, I'll get back to you when he get, comes back to you. And he's like, okay. And then I go to Snarg and NZ, and I cover their stuff for a while. And after a bit, Guido's just sitting there like, I'm not coming back, am I? <laughs> and I, I'm trying not to laugh, because I know exactly where Guido is. And, and, and he's like, am I, am I going to come back? Am I, am I dead? Just tell me, GM, am I dead? We did an entire session of Guido's Adventures, which is why I'm put, putting that off for the moment. Let's talk about the political situation first. Um, when they came back uh, and, and successfully defeated them, they also encountered a thing called a Mataker. And this was actually really important. This is the kind of flavor for this campaign. I haven't really had a huge opportunity to get across. I mentioned the horrible beasts and whatnot. This was my first chance to really showcase how bad that is. A Mataker... Um, I, I said Reed Shark improperly earlier. Remember I mentioned that horrible creature that, that, that Zeriel was trying to escape from? A Mataker would be a better example of what that thing looked like. It, Matakers are really, really tall, three-legged uh, three death machines, basically. And this thing was kind of drawn towards the party, uh, drawn towards the town because of the party's actions. I'll just summarize it that way. And so it actually reached the walls of the city. And those walls exist to help repel things like this, because if a Mataker actually got into the city, that would be bad. What ensued was a multi-hour battle to bring this creature down, with party assistance. Because Matakers are incredibly tough. In, in gameplay terms, their damage resistance and spell resistance is through the roof. And they have tons of health, and they have tons of AC. They are very hard to hit, and they're very hard to damage. And so they spent forever killing this thing. Finally bring this sucker down, because the military is designed to do this sort of thing. Um, finally bring this sucker down, it's like, okay, whew. Thank God. Then they go and meet with uh, an official uh, from the uh, who is a representative of the Osteth Republic. It's actually the Titus himself. Uh, if uh, somewhere I, recently I've talked about how that works, the Titus is not actually like the leader of the Republic. It's more like he's the spokesman for it. So it makes sense that he'd be here. He's here to meet the party. They learn from him. Uh, he they tell him about the Reds thing, and he says, "Oh, well, we'll deal with that." And um, they get a little bit of other information too. It turns out Ricarg had kept good on his deal, uh, the, the the solid he owed to Guido, and just out of absolutely nowhere. About a, a few days prior to now, the, several of the Gotrok had out of nowhere approached the Osteth and petitioned for re-entry back into the Republic. And the, uh, oh, the Senate, hang on. Man, that hurts. The Senate, as I think I've described at least once, needs 100% consensus to make any decisions for the entire Republic, right? That means every mayor of every town has to all agree. So the Senate has been in session for literally days deciding what to do with this Gotrok situation. Because, you know... So now that I've kind of lost my place here... <laughs> Good dog. Um, right. So, they talk to the Titus, and he, he reveals the whole Gotrok thing, as I just mentioned. And I guess we'll go ahead and cover what happened with Guido now, won't we? <laughs> you see, poor, poor Guido. He translated, and, and you know, normally it's like, and you're there, right? Well, he was there in an unusual place. I'm going to not describe this in full detail, because it would take a while to do so, but suffice it to say, he was in an area which was very rocky and filled with just all manner of gemstone and metals, 
and rocks, and you probably already see the direction this is going in. And there were lits, little bits of rock just kind of hovering through the air, little pebbles, uh, pedals, pebbles, pebbles that you could walk into and literally had to like walk through, which created a lot of uh, light pollution too. It was hard to see further than like a mile in front of you as a result of that. But as he was walking, he realized the curvature was going like this. So he was walking like this rather than like this, which is what he was used to. He encountered a strange tribe of creatures there, of large rock golem things, which had faces and mouths, in addition to looking like rock golems. They lacked the ability to communicate with him. He uh, managed to upset them and was basically kicked out. And having no idea what to do, he decided to just walk in a direction, picked a direction, walked for a while, and he spent a while, I'm just going to summarize, he spent a while exploring and trying to figure out what the hell and where the hell. If he looked up, instead of the sun up there, there was just this black star just kind of vibrating up there in the sky. Uh, always directly up, no matter where he was. It was always straight up, like it was high noon. And he also encountered a pylon thing, which he thought about entering and decided against. And he decided to, for the first time in the entire campaign, summon his paladin mount. Now, <laughs> so he summons it, and what comes out is this blackened, bleeding, covered in fire and ichor thing that has bl burning red eyes and and like bones are exposed and it is radiating this wave of just black that's absorbing all color in like a few inches around it uh, it's still horse shaped it's got a saddle and everything and it and it it's not hostile to him or anything it's like you know, yes master what can i do for you you know it's got that connection to him um guido actually had to roll to not attack it on first seeing it because of, of how horrifying and, and eldritch this thing looked and so Guido's like, ah, oh, my trusty steed. <laughs> Just, uh, um, so Guido uh, ends up, for, I'm going to skip forward a little bit because a lot of little fun stuff happened here, a lot of role-playing stuff, but he reaches the end of the world. He literally reaches a plate where, where the terrain just stops and there's just emptiness below him. And he steps out into it for various reasons. And instead of falling, like, here's the, here's the thing, right? Yeah. So instead of falling, like you'd think, he immediately goes up towards the Black Star and collides with the Black Star and uh, wakes up unconscious um, back in the, back in the uh, real world. <laughs> so that's what happened to Guido while he was gone. Uh, meanwhile, back in the real world, a battle is waging. He's still at the same town, and uh, the still Aust same Osteth town here. It turns out the Reds were really pissed off because they actually took losses in that last battle that the players were helping with. They'd never taken losses before because the Osteth didn't know how to deal with that kind of thing and generally didn't aim to kill. So they were back with blood and they had brought two destroyers with them, two, two airships, right? Destroyer is a step down from Frigate for reference. So that's some serious military hardware and they're just beating the crap out of the thing and the players are just barely keeping up. Keeping in mind the players haven't really had a lot of chance to rest and recoup so they're low on health, mana, and stamina. So they're like, oh god. Guido comes back and is like, oh god, I'm, I'm here, what, let's do it, I'm ready, I'm ready. Um, <laughs> right about this point in time, a hollow approaches them. This is the uh, third hollow total that has been seen in the entire campaign, which is a unusual uh, looking creature that's obviously artificial in construction, it has a, lo a long, thin metal mass plate where there should be a face. There's nothing on it though, it's just a, a blank plate. And um, and it's very, very thin, and it's very gangly looking, and it's all its movements are very, you know, like, like it's some kind of bad clockwork robot kind of a situation. And this hollow approaches him and says, hello, and, and it looks at Zeriel and says, hello, I finally have your message ready for you. And Zeriel's like, not right now, we're kind of busy with that airship. And the thing says, one moment, and vanishes, and a few seconds later the airship crashes right in front of them, and the thing pops out of it having just killed everyone on board. Well, not kill, as we'll discover later. But knocked them all out. And says, may we talk now? And Zeriel says, yeah. And the thing says this big old speech about the true nature of what Zeriel is, which is very convoluted and deliberately designed to be uh, not clear. Uh, I won't share it with you now, because then I just have to look it back up. I'm not actually sure why I have that saved. But either way, Zeriel's like, okay, that's great. 
Now what? And the thing says, well, we need to talk about you cavorting with the enemy. She's like, what? It's like, yes, you, you, you need to stop interacting with, our, with the enemy. And it takes her a while to commu communicate with this thing, what the hell it's talking about, but it ends up that it perceives Guido as the enemy. After some shenanigans involving that, the thing leaves again, just gone. It doesn't look like translation, by the way, it just it goes away. And they decide to hi hijack that destroyer. They hijack the destroyer, take off with it, barely escape from the Reds and the Osteth who were arriving with their own airship uh, in time. Take the thing all the way north into the Navaria lands, get the sucker repaired, hire a crew, and then they're given... I'm, I'm skipping a lot of little stuff, forgive me. But, uh, you know, they're they given a choice. They can... You know, they, they want to get back to Al-Jalima. So, like, they're here. Al-Jalima's here, and the war zone is literally in the middle. I mean, quite literally in the middle. So they have the choice to do this, or do this. So they go straight through. Um, so naturally, the first thing that happens... That sounds stupider than it is. They actually took a lot of precautions. They had regular sensor spikes going on and were checking the radar and were pretty sure that their ship could outrun any of enemy ships. They just ended up being wrong on all of the above counts because these alluvian frigates, which look kind of familiar, uh, showed up out of nowhere and were somehow faster than them and had equipment that were very, was very unusual. They weren't shooting on the destroyer to kill or destroy. They weren't shooting magic cannons or mundane cannons. They actually had literal hooks attached to chains, massive, thick, you know, several, several meters thick chains um, that were trying to bring the destroyer down, literally force it to the ground, which is a very unusual tactic. Uh, the party did a lot of stuff, got the captain of their ship killed, uh, tried to take one of the frigates that was after them, ended up fleeing for their lives, and as a result of all this, decided, okay, we, we need to put in somewhere. So they landed in Danby's. Now, <laughs> for some reason, their crew decided to abandon them after that little mess. I, I, I can't possibly imagine why. So they were left with... <laughs> this is great, because they, they then just left the ship with the door open, and they're just like, eh. They come back, oh, someone's in our ship, dang! And so they had to fight those people out, and then this happened like three or four more times. It became kind of a running gag, and they just kept leaving the door open to their military-grade destroyer just parked there for all to see <laughs> in in the town of Danby's Outpost. City of Danby's Outpost, excuse me. But the party decided to hang here for a while. Uh, Guido wanted to network to try and get that, that company going. He actually got some good progress on that, got uh, purchased several caravans and tried to start getting some money flow going. Uh, Snarg and Guido both really wanted to watch the arena, which I'll talk about in a moment, and Zeriel kind of wanted to do something off camera, which she went and did. Um, so this is the tournament thing. We're getting very close to the modern uh, catch-up at this point. The tournament, I, I explained all the tournament in the actual videos, of course, but to summarize, it's a non-lethal tournament, obviously. And it's pretty much the first blood sport to be ratified legally in the history of the world. In the last 350 years, this is pretty much the first time this has happened. And that's why it's been so popular. This is the first place that's been set up. And if you'll remember, I hinted about this all the way back in, like, the second adventure ever. It was like they had a choice to go help out this one town or go to this brand new arena, which at the time was brand new. So in the last... Uh, I guess five months, something like that. Uh, this place has grown from being a, a dingy little thing to this massive city, which says something, actually. And as the party investigates, they find out that this place has military-grade protection, which is odd, because that's a weird use for it, especially given the circumstances, and some serious financial and political backing. No one's really sure why, on both accounts. Uh, Danby himself, of course, is not inclined to share. He's a banderling, uh, if it matters. And so the, the arena itself is to uh, is to the defeat, you know, whoever goes to downed or surrenders first. Uh, if you actually kill someone, which has only happened like a couple of times in the history of this thing in the past few months, the other person is is charged with murder. And so that that's kind of an issue. Uh, they do have people on hand to deal with that. They also have white mages that they've hired on hand to deal with that, which is also significant because white mages are very, very rare because of how difficult it is to actually learn white magery. So that's that's a, it also speaks to the backing and, and funding that this place makes. This place makes tons of money, though. There's lots of gambling. There's lots of tourism. Tons and tons of merchants have set up in this area because of what a nexus it is for people. It's become something of a, a hub, kind of as a result of the fights happening right over there. 
which is kind of natural when you think about it. It's basically a big sporting event. So there's several tiers, uh, bronze, silver, gold, platinum. Uh, you, you, you try out and you basically have to, you're, you're slotted into a tier they believe you should be in. Um, and you fight, and there's a, there's like tons and tons and tons and tons and tons and tons of bronze fighters. Like 80% of all the people who combat are in the, in the bronze tier. And then like way tinier slivers are silver and gold and like, there's usually like 10 platinum people total. So five matches. So... Naturally, Snarg and Guido want to compete individually, and so they go ahead and, and try out, and they're, they're slotted into Platinum, as you might imagine for players of their level. And they actually had quite a bit of a fight of it. There were a lot of uh, really fun fights. We, I tried to make it as interesting and engaging as I could, and really show off what you could do uh, with, with several of the prestige classes. And then they, uh, Snarg was like, I want to face the champion. And so he ends up facing the champion, which is Relin. Of, of Mechazod, or Great Gear, whatever the hell his name was, the guy who was actually a member of the party in the very first adventure. He was a little gnome gentleman. Um, they, end, uh, they end up barely, Snarg ends up barely defeating him. He's nearly destroyed in the process, and Snarg's like, oh, thank God, I've won! It was a great fight, awesomeness all around. Um, he is taken, you know, backstage to meet with Danby himself, and Danby offers him Relin's job. You see, Relin actually can't cast magic anymore. Relin had become addicted to Lay Slice, and that removes your ability to cast magic after a while, after extensive, you know, overdose, basically. So, Relin was still a, a charismatic and intelligent individual, so he was able to play the part, and he had several magical devices that were custom woven for him, which would basically cast the spells for him, so it looked like he could still cast. And all he had to do was go out occasionally and just obliterate whoever challenged him with one shot, because you can do that as a black mage. Um, and then, you know, play the part of the part of the champion and, and, and be a cool guy and all that. And it it gave, in, in Danby's own words, it gave the people something to aim for, even if they were never intended to be able to beat him. Uh, Snark, Snark kind of hammer, hang, hang, haggled on this, but basically, Snark also found out that Danby had not just backers, uh, not just a backer, but backers. He had multiple different parties who were helping him to keep this place running that were giving all those political and uh, financial and resource backings I already mentioned, including something in the military, which they never found out exactly what. So finally they're like, okay, fine. They go back, you know, Snarg's the champion, they, they win some money, they get some loot, it's cool. They take their ship and they're like, okay, let's get back to, let's get, let's head to Fox Ridge. You know, we haven't actually been to our mountain yet. It should be, you know, kind of ready for us at this point in time, because we gave the location to uh, to Ricarg and to the uh, someone else, right? There's something else really important. I'm sorry, this actually happened earlier. Uh, when they first went to Kayabanan, or Alarkos, I forget which, but either way, they went to one of the cities in the Alarkos state to repair the destroyer. That's when they got their first crew, remember that? While they were there, Snarg was on the tri got onto the airship and saw something he'd never actually seen before. It was a woman with kind of decaying skin and a very, uh, I'd say, desiccated look to her. She didn't look rotten. She looked like she was just dried out. And she introduced herself as, uh, well, actually, she, she asked, introduced herself as a member of House Vasmora, which is a house that's, that's come up several times now. Um... And she wanted to work with Snarg. And Snarg's like, well, I don't want to be, you know, with you if you just want to do whatever. And she's like, no, I just want to fix things. And I was very particular. I was actually role-playing her and, and doing the best I could. And I, I was very particular in my word choice. And I tried to get to Snarg in a way I felt that would reach the, the, play, the, the character, Snarg. You know, Vasmora's approach was all, I just want to get stuff done. I want to stop standing around and talking about it and you know, hand wringing and going, oh gosh, things are horrible. I want to actually fix things. Can we go fix things? And so Snarg agreed to go ahead and work with her, and she was like, excellent. And that's where uh, the House Vesmora got the location of Fox Ridge. This is relevant because that was almost a week before what I'm about to say. So then they get to Fox Ridge a week later after the whole Dambies thing, and they get there, and lo and behold, they are, there's, construction is fully underway, they've got half the place, they're building into the mountain, there's an airship dock here, they're working on a second airship dock, huge facility, huge setup, I'm hopeful to find a really good picture to show this thing off uh, eventually, um, 
lots and lots of awesome stuff. They've they've the thing is the place has tons of internal facilities, training facilities, barracks, uh, storage groups. So it'll be it'll be a perfect location for all three of the groups organizations, you know, the spy the spy hub can function there, the company can function there for trading and shipping and of course you know, Blood Fox, which is the primary people actually own the place uh, and run the place will be able to function there too. And it all came at one small little cost. Uh, the the place that is being constructed by lycanthropes several thousand lycanthropes. Most of them are here from House Vesmora. Some of them are not. <laughs> Some of them are ones that have been tied here as a result of uh, Rakarg's favor to get this place up and running. And there's one other little snag too. See, a while ago, more or less by accident, I kind of skipped over this on purpose because it would it was a very convoluted situation, but more or less by accident, the party stumbled into a directorate agent. I haven't mentioned the directorate much since then, but uh, trust me, they've been active. And they and and after some talking, they decided to go ahead and ally with this directorate agent. They're like, okay, yeah, we'll we'll go ahead. And we we will be members of the directorate. Um, well, funny story. Uh, Danby's outpost was under the jurisdiction of the directorate. <clears throat> one of the backers I mentioned. And so the new crew they got for the destroyer to get them here was actually a directorate crew. When they got to Fox Ridge, they found out that several of those lycanthropes were also loyal to the directorate. And the directorate is now aware of this place and will likely be using it as a base camp in the future. Now, if that wasn't enough of a big bombshell to end on, the final, the final session, the last one we've had up until now, I have not uh, done any more sessions after this, was a session in which uh, they just they found out that the war had just heated up even more. Yerak had come out of absolutely nowhere with a stunning counterattack. Yerak had been losing consistently. Like if if this was you know Yerak's over here and this is where the old boundary was with Alluvia, this boundary has just been being pushed back over and over and over and over. And it was like about this point, you know, Alluvia had conquered a huge swath of territory, and I've mentioned this several times. Um, well, Yarek came back and just started pushing right back out of absolutely nowhere, completely destroying the Illuvian resistance because Yarek was employing entire companies of Tuskers. And that's the cliffhanger we're going to stop on. So, see you next time.